Welcome into the program. Thank you for being with us today. As always, I'm Caleb Colquitt. You're listening to Tactics on News Radio 1440's Facebook page. Lots to get to today on this Wednesday. I know we're getting started a little late, and I do apologize for that, but there has been an opportunity that I had to uh, go and see about, and unfortunately, the only time they could meet was 8.30, which meant I got out late, which means I showed up here late, and so it was a cascading effect, and we'll probably have a little bit shorter show than normal today, but nonetheless, there is a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and get right to it. First off in local news, Abortion Jones strikes yet again. That's right, Abortion Jones, there was a bill to essentially eliminate taxpayer funding of abortions permanently. This bill was called the No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion and Abortion Insurance Full Disclosure Act, which is a mouthful in and of itself. But nonetheless, the idea behind this thing, and I think that most of the Republicans that signed on to it and voted for it knew that it had almost no chance of passing because of the the Senate does not have a supermajority in uh, on the Republican side. And so because of that, the Republicans do not have a supermajority, and they were pretty sure, I don't want to say certain, but they were probably pretty sure that this thing was not going to pass. And so even though I do applaud all of the members of the House and the Senate that voted in favor of it, I am still somewhat skeptical. Actually, I don't know. This one may not have even originated in the House. It may be Senate only. But nonetheless, uh, though I do applaud the people that voted in favor of it, it's one of those votes that you could have probably cast your vote for it safely, whether you actually believed in it or not, to try to drum up support for your, for your constituents. So I'm, I'm not saying that that happened with any in particular senator. I'm just saying if they wanted to, they could have done that. And yet, here was Senator Doug Jones voting against it. And so what this bill would do is it would permanently end any sort of taxpayer funding that goes to abortions in a direct or indirect way. And so if it was found that somehow taxpayer dollars were finding their way to a uh, to abortions, that immediately gets cut off. So for example, the subsidies for abortions that were allowed for under Obamacare, those would be eliminated immediately. In fact, that's one of the primary reasons this act was put together is because they wanted to go ahead and figure out a way to eliminate that particular problem that has been going on for some time now. And the thing is, this used to not be a controversial stance. Back in the day, this was not a controversial stance. And when I say back in the day, I don't mean like the 70s. I mean like a few years ago. Back before Obamacare, it was always a understood thing that taxpayer money is not supposed to go to abortion. Now, granted, we were funding Planned Parenthood before then, but we were always at least saying, and now they've pretty much even dropped the, the veil and the lie that they had been going on about for years, that Planned Parenthood is not using that money for abortions. But back then, they always used to say, well, you know, we're giving it to organizations that do abortions, but they've assured us that they're not actually using that money for abortions, they're using it for other things. Which is a load of crap. But even if you don't think that's a load of crap, at least they were saying and portraying the idea that while abortion should be legal, at least in the minds of the Democrats, the Democrats would always maintain the stance that, but taxpayer money should not go to funding it because it is such a controversial hot-button issue and there are people that have moral aversions to it. That used to be a pretty common stance amongst the Democrats. That's gone completely out the window. They are abortion on demand anytime you want, for any reason you want, and you know what, the taxpayers ought to be paying for it. I mean, for goodness sake, this is the party that advocated for illegal immigrants people that are not even citizens, being able to get abortions on the taxpayer dime, which from a strategic standpoint doesn't even really make sense from the Democrats because shouldn't the Democrats want, I mean, they love them some anchor babies. So you would think that they would actually be against illegal immigrants at least getting abortions. But nonetheless, this is the position that we are with now. This is the position that we are at to where now we are saying that the Democrats' official stance is no longer safe, legal, and rare, but fund it anytime, anywhere, for any reason, and the taxpayer ought to be footing the bill for it. I mean, right now, in the state of New York, there is a good chance, and you remember us talking about this a few days ago, because this is the shutdown that is being threatened in the state of New York by the governor, that he is going to shut down the government if he does not get the bill that he wants passed, and that would be a bill that would essentially legalize abortion at any point, up until birth, and remove abortion from all forms of the criminal code. 
So, I mean, just horrific things are happening, unfortunately. The more divided we become as a country, the more partisan we become, and this issue in particular is becoming one that is increasingly divisive from the left and the right. The right is going, thankfully, further in the direction of being pro-life. The left is going further in the direction of being for abortion anytime, anywhere. They've moved away from that safe, legal, and rare moniker. In fact, this law that we're talking about in New York would allow for non-doctors to perform abortions. So, I mean, they're basically treating it like, would you want somebody that is not a mechanic servicing your car? I would think not. If you, I mean, you can pay less and risk your money if you want to. If it's just some dude that you know that happens to be mechanically savvy, that's one thing. But this would allow for this practice, which they constantly refer to as a medical operation. That's what they always refer it to because they feel like it sanitizes the fact that they're killing a child in the womb. They continue to call it a medical procedure, a medical operation. And yet they're saying, but you shouldn't have to be a doctor to perform it. And what's so funny about this is the, this is the same fight they were having in Texas about two years ago when they were passing a law saying that you had to have this thing done in a hospital. So it's really funny that they've completely done away with rare. Remember, because the platform used to be safe, legal, and rare. They've done away with rare. In fact, they have people at Planned Parenthood saying, shout your abortion, and you should be proud of it, and we should have more abortions. You've got idiots like Lena Dunham saying that she wishes she had an abortion. She wants to get pregnant just so she can have an abortion. I mean, really disgusting stuff. So they don't really want it rare anymore, and they don't seem real concerned about whether or not it's safe. The left actually went after people on the right for talking about Kermit Gosnell. I mean, the guy that was absolutely running a horror show with some of the issue with, with this abortion clinic that he was running. I mean, keeping babies' body parts in jars and, I mean, just seriously, horror movie stuff. And a lot of people on the left were actually defending him. And then you've got both in the state of Texas a couple years ago and in the state of New York now saying that basically anybody that wants to can just go in and, and perform an abortion. And you can do it in a clinic, you can do it at a house, doesn't really matter. And I'm sitting there thinking, I thought you guys were worried about it being safe. I mean, if you want it to be safe, shouldn't you want a licensed certified doctor performing it? And shouldn't you want this to take place in a medical facility that is well equipped to handle stuff like this? Or to handle what happens to the mother if there are complications or something like that? I mean, if you want it safe, then you would think that would be a common sense measure to try to make sure that women are injured in this medical procedure. But see, that's the thing. The truth is, they never did really care whether it was rare. And they never did really care whether or not it was safe. The only thing they really want is legal. Legal is the only thing they're actually concerned about and they're showing their true colors by supporting laws like this. And Doug Jones is no exception. Doug Jones has voted for, essentially, by voting against this bill, he's voting for the continuation of taxpayer money going to abortions. And by the way, this bill would have also gotten rid of federal funding for Planned Parenthood. It would have gotten rid of any third party provider that also does abortions receiving federal money. And so Senator Shelby voted in favor of the bill and tweeted this out the other day. Americans, hard-earned taxpayer dollars shouldn't be used to fund abortions, and this bill would permanently prohibit that. Let's work together to pass legislation that protects and defends life. And then, of course, you have, on the other side, the other senator from our great state, Abortion Jones, Doug Jones, voted against the bill. And Here's the thing about Doug Jones' voting record, and you guys know that I'm a stickler for this. I follow this stuff meticulously because I believe that a voting record is the number one way to tell whether or not you should vote for somebody in the future or not. Because when Doug Jones was elected, you may recall, I said, I think this guy's a radical. I think that he's, you know, somebody that's uber, uber liberal. I don't think that there's anything moderate about him. But we'll wait and see. We'll wait and see what he does. Well, now we know. This guy has a spotless voting record when it comes to being pro-choice. Pro if you wanted abortion to be available at any point, Doug Jones is your guy. He voted against the 25-week ban that would have banned abortions after 25 weeks in the United States, which, by the way, would have not only stopped this New York law, 
but also would have made us, you know, more in step with even the modern world that accepts abortions. We're one of only six countries that allows abortions federally uh, on the federal level after 25 weeks. One of six. And you've got countries like China and North Korea on there. And so, I mean, it's just absolutely reprehensible, this kind of stuff that Doug Jones supports and the kind of stuff that he votes for. If you wanted somebody that was just for abortion anytime, anywhere, and it doesn't matter the reason, doesn't matter whether it's safe for the woman, we just need abortion, Doug Jones is absolutely your guy. And he's showing that. Representative Bradley Byrne said today, or said about this, Today, Senate Democrats blocked a bill that would permanently end taxpayer funding of abortion. I was especially disappointed that one of the senators standing up for the, uh, sorry, uh, one of the votes against the pro-life bill came from Doug Jones, one of Alabama's senators. Standing up for the unborn and opposing abortion is a core Alabama value, and today's vote shows the urgent need for more pro-life senators. Now, I agree with him 100%. Bradley Byrne is on point. But I do want to pose this question to you, because taking the statement at its face value, I think that this does show, and Bradley Byrne has a good record of this, being a pro-life person. But here's my follow-up question to this. Do you notice how he worded that last sentence? Today's vote shows the urgent need for more pro-life senators. Do you think maybe, and I'm just floating this out here, that he is planning to challenge Doug Jones in 2020? Could be. That does seem to be the statement of a man that is at least contemplating on that. At least saying, maybe there should be somebody that's pro-life in that slot, and maybe that person should be me. I don't know that for sure. That's mere speculation. That's just Caleb's opinion. But it seems to me that that may be laying a little bit of the groundwork for a Senate campaign of his own. And if he were to run, I think Bradley Byrne has a pretty good shot. So that's just an interesting little side note from the main issue. And, of course, you have a statement from our main man, State Auditor Jim Ziegler, one of the best elected officials in the state of Alabama. He said this, The abortion vote shows again that Doug Jones does not represent the people of Alabama. Jones is for abortion up to the moment of birth. Alabama people are pro-life. Now, here's another person that it doesn't sound so much in that particular statement like he may be setting up for a Senate run like you have Bradley Byrne doing. But uh, if Jim Ziegler were to want run, I would certainly back him. But anyway, Jim Ziegler, the state auditor, is saying that, and he's right. Jones is a horrific representative for this state. I mean, if you were looking for somebody that was the exact opposite of the state they're representing, Doug Jones is about as close as you can get. Doug Jones is a very far left-leaning radical, and Alabama is ruby red, arguably the most conservative state in the country. You're looking at us demographically. We have a higher approval rating for President Trump than any state other than West Virginia. We kind of switch back and forth depending on the month with West Virginia. And you're looking at our voting records and, and the way that we vote for representatives. We are a very, very, very deep red state. And yet, we have somebody like Doug Jones, who is about as far the opposite of us as you can get. The only thing that might be worse is if we had Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. That would be about the only thing that would be worse, as far as the Senate goes. And if I'm not mistaken, she's actually too young to even be a senator. If I'm not mistaken, I'd have to uh, look up my constitution, and I do have it right here, so I could look that up if I really needed to. Uh, but I don't believe she's actually even attained the age that you are required to have obtained by the time you become a senator. But anyway, so that's where we stand right now. Doug Jones said in a recent interview, I'm the biggest pro-lifer there uh, is once they're born. Okay, let's take that statement and, and see if it bears out logically. You're the biggest pro-lifer there is once they're born. So if we were to reverse that statement and make it age-dependent, which is what he's doing, he's saying that the age matters here, well, then could I say that I'm the biggest pro-lifer there is until they're 60? Because after they're 60, you just kind of need to off them. They're old. They're probably not going to live much longer anyway. Let's just, you know, cut it off at 60. That would solve the Social Security problem for sure. We would no longer have a problem with Social Security being in the red because there would be no people over 60. 
And so there's all kinds of benefits to just killing everybody that's over 60. We really need to do this. This is going to be my platform from now on. Everybody above 60, you get the knife. Sorry. That's how it goes. We just can't afford to keep you alive anymore. Yeah, that's like the core of socialist ideology. Look at the, I mentioned this, I don't know how many times. Look at the Complete Live System and Ezekiel Emanuel, the guy who crafted Obamacare. This is the plan. You off all the people under a certain age and above a certain age, or you certainly don't expend any resources to keep them alive. You don't necessarily go out and seek them to kill them, but you certainly don't expend any of the state's resources or the government's resources to try to keep them alive. And when you're talking about a system where the government runs virtually everything, that means that you just do not worry about humans that are less valuable than the ones that are in the middle. And this is essentially Doug Jones' mentality, because you could apply that statement to anything. Oh, I'm the biggest pro-lifer there is. Well, except for Jews. I mean, you know, Jews. Nobody cares about them. You see how you could say that and twist that? You see how you could take that and basically use it against anybody? You use age, you could use height, you could use weight. Fat people, they don't need to be alive. They eat so much food. Let's just, I'm the bigger, pro, biggest pro-lifer there is, well, until you're over 250 pounds, and then then there's really no hope for you. See, if you're not pro-life, if you don't believe that humanity and human beings have an intrinsic value that is bestowed upon them by the Creator, then you're not pro-life. And the thing is, once you have crossed that line to where you no longer believe that humanity has intrinsic value, that a human life has value above just being a an animal or a cluster of, of cells or whatever else you want to call it, then you're no longer really pro-life. Doug Jones is not pro-life. He is not pro-life at all. He is pro-life for the people that he wants to be alive, which is to say that he's not pro-life. That's the problem that you come into when you're looking at that logically. What if we did that with IQ? Everybody with below this IQ, you're not really human, you're not smart enough to keep alive, let's go ahead and off you right now. You see, he's putting a condition on the idea of being pro-life, which means that he's not really pro-life, because any exception to that rule means that you're not pro-life because this is a question of equality. If you said that, oh, I'm for equality for everybody, I'm equality for everybody except for black people, except for Hispanics, except for Asians, except for white people, I'm for equality for everybody except this one particular subgroup, well, then you're not for equality. And it's the same thing with life. If you are not for life for everybody, if you are not pro the idea that human life is intrinsically valuable and ought to be protected under law, then you are not pro-life. And this is the problem that we run into. So Shelby, I think really, is the biggest beneficiary of this whole thing. And I'm not saying this to bash Senator Shelby. I think that Senator Shelby is a mixed bag. He's done some things I really like. I think that he was spot on when it comes to this vote. But, you know, he does some things that I'm not necessarily a fan of. He's a very powerful senator, been there for a long time, on a lot of really important committees. But when it comes to this, let's be honest, I don't think that this was intentional, but Senator Richard Shelby is the biggest beneficiary to Doug Jones being the other senator from Alabama, because this makes him look like the conservative senator. And for a long time, Senator Shelby was the less conservative senator because of Jeff Sessions. Now Senator Shelby, I mean, next to Doug Jones, just about anybody looks like me. <laughs> they look as limited government as I do. And so I really think that you're seeing a bump in Shelby's approval ratings, and the reason that you're seeing that is because Senator Doug Jones is so horrifically bad as a representative for the state of Alabama that you're actually seeing Shelby's numbers go up. Now, there are going to be some nefarious people that probably suggest that he planned this, that it's the reason that he said what he did about encouraging people to do writing campaigns, that secretly he wanted Doug Jones to win. I don't think that's true. I think that that's attributing motive in a very unproductive way, to say the least. But let's be honest about that. I'm not proposing that we accept that particular story. I'm just saying that, let's be honest, he is the number one beneficiary to Doug Jones being in office. And uh, maybe the only other person that is benefiting quite a bit from this, even though I don't see it uh, in a very practical way, would be Luther Strange. Luther Strange's profile has got to be looking better when he's saying, see, you could have had me, now you got him. But I, st I still think Shelby is probably the number one beneficiary of that. But 
the bottom line is Doug Jones is an absolute blight on this state for supporting something like taxpayer-funded abortions, and the sooner he is gone, in my opinion, the better. The better for our state, the better for our country. Now, we have another story that I've got to delve into, and I know I promised we'd go over it today, but I think that this is arguably the most important story of the year so far. And the reason is because despite all the other things that have happened, and I'm not trying to downplay their importance, I'm trying to say that this is incredibly important for us because it is a fight that the, that the media picked, and now they're stuck with it. And now they're looking foolish, and the average person, anybody that is a fair-minded individual that isn't just a hardcore leftist that wants to believe anything the media says, is at a crossroads. They can either accept that the media has a pretty strong liberal-leaning bias and completely screwed up the story, or they can take the stance of, I'm just going to believe what I want to believe, and screw truth, I'm just going to go with whatever fits my political agenda. And I'm afraid there's going to be an awful lot of people that choose door number two. But the point in all of this is that this ought to be a teachable moment to everyone, Myself included, and I'm going to include myself in this. So we all know about the story that's going on with the Covington kids, and I'm going to try to sort through some of the malarkey, some of the uh, the mud, and, and clear the waters a little bit on this story to give you a better idea of exactly what is going on when it comes to this story. So uh, they're in a really bad way right now. The parents of these kids have received death threats on multiple occasions. Uh, especially when it comes to this one kid um, that was kind of at the center of the whole thing. They had to cancel classes yesterday at Covington High School because they were receiving so many threats and they felt that the school was unsafe. They've had to cancel a couple of sporting events, a couple of basketball games because of this. And the school is now being threatened by multiple people on the left calling for blood when it comes to this guy. I mean, the media malpractice here is insane. And the thing is, they had to know that this was going to happen. They had to know that there were going to be people coming after these people. You have some despicable people like Kathy Griffin, even directly, calling for violence against these kids. And saying that they should be locked up in cages. Uh, who was it the other day that said they should be locked behind an electric fence or something like that? I don't remember. Some moron celebrity that has a lot more fame than they know what to do with. But... You have people coming after these kids, and I want to sort through this because I have evolved on this story. When it first came out, I didn't jump to conclusions right away because my spidey senses were tingling and I knew that there was something amiss here, but I still said more than I probably should have on the outset of this story, and I think that a lot of us probably did. I know a lot of conservatives, a lot of conservative voices that I like, that I respect, that initially saw this story, initially saw this video, and condemned the kids at Covington. Good friends of mine in the, the local area, people that I know personally, started condemning these people that are conservatives. And part of the reason for that is because we as conservatives believe in holding one another accountable. We believe that you're supposed to call out your own. And because the left doesn't do that, and because it annoys the living fire out of us, it seems that sometimes, again, including myself in this, Sometimes we're a little too fast to rush to judgment, even when it comes to people that are presumably on our side or on the right, however you want to classify it. You know I'm not a big Make America Great Again person. I don't necessarily feel any loyalty to people that happen to be wearing those hats. I'm not a big Donald Trump guy. But nonetheless, I think that because people on the right often complain about how people on the left don't call out their own, that maybe we were a little too quick to rush to judgment. And that is a lesson to be learned here. So I think the lesson that we can all take from this is when a story like this breaks that is specifically tailored to outrage people, and you can usually tell when that's taking place, sometimes it's smart to stop, take a breath, and very seriously consider what the possible explanations are for this before commenting on it. Because I wish that I had done that at least a little bit more. I saw the story immediately, I posted it with no comment, just posting it as though it was news, and trying to inform people, but afterward, when I saw some commentary on it, I jumped into the conversation, and I did refer to these kids as jerks. I said, 
look, they're not hurting anybody. They're not trying to shout the guy down or anything. But with the chance and everything, yeah, it comes off as kind of being a jerk. And these are kids that probably just, you know, aren't either don't know any better, not that that excuses it, or are acting, behaving badly, I think is the exact word that I used. But the really important thing here is that context matters. And so what we're going to do is we're going to actually kind of take this in reverse. We're going to start with what was initially reported and then work our way back to what we know now and show you kind of how the story has evolved. So for that, we're going to go ahead and go to the original video, a little clip from the original video that was put out there that caused everybody to get outraged, caused CNN and the Detroit Free Press and the Washington Post to seek out the guy in this video to ask him about his experience here. So let's go ahead and watch that. Okay, so you can see that video. It looks like what is happening is that you've got a Native American guy there. Uh, by the way, his name is Nathan Phillips, and he claims to be a, a Vietnam vet. So he's there banging his drum, and it looks like a bunch of kids are harassing him and yelling at him and sort of making fun of his chant, and they're chanting along with the beat of the drum, kind of uh, you know, mocking him, and you have the kid there who he's stuck in this situation and he's just kind of smiling and it, it seems as though he's taking it lightly and almost kind of taunting the guy. And that's the narrative that we saw. I can't tell you how many headlines I saw with this particular video that says uh, MAGA hat wearing teen taunts Native American veteran and, and all this other stuff, all different forms of essentially the same thing. And they had interviews with this guy, Nathan Phillips who uh, they've done all kinds of interviews with him. They've done it on video. CNN actually found the guy, brought him in, had a sit down with him, had an interview. And the thing that made me a little bit suspicious of this story even early on is, why are there no interviews with the kid? Why is it that nobody has sought him out and tried to get his side of the story? Why is it that nobody in the mainstream media thought that, Maybe we should at least get a statement from the kid, because usually in a situation like this, and this is where having a little bit of background in journalism actually does help me, if they can't get a hold of the party, they will say, near the usually near the end of an article, uh, so-and-so could not be reached for comment. They didn't even try to find this kid. They didn't even do that. They didn't even seek out the other side of this story. And it is massive media malpractice to only get one side of the story. Even if you think the other side is absolutely despicable, you at least try to reach out to them and get a statement from them. If nothing else, just say that you did. For example, I reached out to the, uh, the alt-right white nationalist movement. The, you remember when Richard Spencer, who was a big guy in the alt-right movement, came by Auburn. I reached out to his people and tried to get a statement, and they never returned back to me because I wanted to get both sides of the story. And so even if you think one side is absolutely detestable and you think it's clear cut, you still look for confirmation. Nobody in the media even thought to do that. Nobody even tried. They went straight to the Native American because it fit with a narrative that they liked and they ran with it. And I posted this original video right when it came out because I thought, okay, this is newsworthy. It's on CNN. It's on the Washington Post. I'm going to give people a chance to see it and decide for themselves. And then when the discussion got in, I got into it a little bit, and I did condemn these kids without a whole lot of information. Uh, I said that their behavior was very disrespectful, and it's not good to mock another person's culture, no matter what it is, no matter whether you agree with it or not. And so I was, I wouldn't say fired up, but I was certainly fairly sure in my stance that at the very least these kids 
were behaving in a disrespectful manner and that they should be called out on that. But I got it wrong. And maybe that's a teachable lesson for all of us that we need to really have our skepticism even higher than mine is, and mine's pretty high compared to the average person. And so we really, really need to be skeptical of these media narratives that come out and not just assume that they're probably right. Now, I also don't believe that it's healthy to do what I've also seen people online doing that assume that it's wrong just because it's coming from the mainstream media, because that's not good either. Because it would have been also wrong if this were the whole story and there were not more context and there were not more information for people to just give these kids an excuse just because they happen to be wearing a MAGA hat. Because that's not right either. But we need to be able to change our minds on a story when more information comes out. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people that are sticking to that original narrative and trying so hard to stick to this original narrative, even though it's been completely debunked by new information that has come out. And uh, I also posted an MSNBC story with quotes from Nathan Phillips saying that the teens were raised to think of him as less than human. And that, again, was another red flag for me. That's when I started getting suspicious, and you'll see on my Twitter feed, at Tactics Radio if you want to follow me, that I said, well, now, hold on. All I'm seeing in this video is this kid looking and, and sort of laughing and smiling a little bit at the situation. So maybe you think that that's taunting a little bit. Maybe you think, okay, that's ridiculous. But that doesn't mean the kid thinks that you're less than human. That doesn't even mean that it's necessarily racially motivated. I mean, smiling at somebody because they have a drum in their hand and are beating it, how is that racism? And the answer is, these people were assuming, and at that point I understood that Nathan Phillips was assuming the kid was racist simply because he was white which, by the way, is ironically racist in and of itself, that if you're assuming a bad behavior in somebody because of the color of their skin, that's the textbook definition of racism. And so what we're seeing here, and this is really where this story started to unravel for me, they claimed that they were blocking him and wouldn't let him retreat, which, again, if you have a crowd of teenagers from a school, even if they're clean cut, if you have them surrounding you and just sort of leering at you, while you're in the middle of this, that would be really freaking intimidating. And I understand that that would be a bad thing, but it turns out that's not true either, and we're going to get into some of that with a little bit of this later. So this is, uh, also said that they were chanting, build the wall, and uh, we'll get into that in a second as well, but I wanted to read to you uh, real quickly, I have an article here from MSNBC, and, and they took a statement. Uh, this one's actually, I take that back, that, this one's from the Detroit Free Press. So I want you to hear the way that the press ran with this story. The headline is Native American leader of Michigan, mob mentality in students was scary. On Friday, his battle gained national attention as social media videos captured his standoff with a group of taunting Catholic students in the nation's capital. The video of Phillips peacefully drumming and singing while surrounded by a hostile crowd illustrates the nation political and racial tensions. Does that sound like objective journalism to you? Does that sound like the Detroit Free Press actually did their homework and went and tried to get a statement from these kids or tried to find other witnesses that were at the event or find other footage, other videos of this event happening? Sounds to me like they had their mind made up from the onset. Sounds to me like they just decided that these kids were the bad guy based on this little three-minute video. And if you're reading through the rest of the article, the reason that they've got that idea is because of this guy, Nathan Phillips. So in the interview, he said, and this is a quote directly from him, they witnessed these individuals on their soapbox saying that what they had to say, Phillips said, they didn't agree with it and got offended. Then things got heated. They were in the process of attacking these four black individuals, Phillips said. I was there and witnessing all of this. So as I kept going on and escalating, I just got to the point where you do something or walk away, you know? You see something that is wrong, and you're faced with that choice of right or wrong. Okay, so according to this guy's characterization of it, these high school kids were attacking four black individuals, and he stepped in to try to quell the tension. So he paints himself as this hero that's jumping in the middle of this and trying to stop 
these evil MAGA hat wearing white kids from just attacking these four black people. So let's go on and see what he has to say a little bit later. There was that moment where I realized I put myself between beast and prey, Philip said. These young men were beastly, and these old black individuals was their prey, and I stood that between them, and so they needed their pounds of flesh, so they needed their pounds of flesh, and they were looking at me for that. The crowd of students, some who wore MAGA caps, mocked Native Americans while chanting, build the wall, and using derogatory language, he said. The student had a mob mentality that was scary, Philip said. It was ugly, and these kids were involved in it. It was racism, it was hatred, and it was scary. Speaking from his niece's homes, Philip said, I'm a Marine Corps veteran, and I know that mob menta what mob mentality can be like. There it was. I, it got to the point to where they just needed something for them to just tear them apart. I mean, it was that ugly. Phillips then recalled the looks in these young men's faces. I mean, if you go back and look at the lynchings that were done in America and you see the faces on people, the glee and the hatred in their faces, this is what these faces look like. Okay, so the characterization that this guy is giving of these kids, these high school students from Covington High, is that they were predators and these black people were prey. I put myself between them. They needed a pound of flesh. There was a mob mentality. They were ready to tear tear me apart. They were like people that did lynchings in America. I mean, just absolutely horrific stuff coming from this guy and the characterization of these kids and saying that they were surrounding him and that they were racist and I could see the hatred in their faces, the hatred for Native Americans. There's only one problem with that. Not a dang word of it is true. And the reason that I know not a dang word of it is true is because we have actual footage of the event that has come out since then. So let's go ahead and look at this next clip, which shows it blows a pretty big hole in his story. So there's a couple things you need to take away from that particular video clip. First of all, this whole idea that he couldn't retreat and this crowd surrounded him. No, no, no. He went into the crowd. He went up to them. And the only people behind him are his fellow Native Americans that are protesting there at the mall. So you can't stop somebody from retreating when you're the one that walked up to them and approached them. And the only people behind you were your people. They didn't close this guy in. They didn't keep him from getting out. They didn't put him in a pressure situation. He went to them. And there was no way that they, you could say that he couldn't retreat because there's nothing but open space behind him. He could have retreated in any direction except for forward. And to be honest, if he politely asked those kids to move, I'm guessing they probably would have. But anyway... You're looking at this, and that blows a huge hole in his theory. And here's another thing that I wanted you to pick up on as well. Did you notice that before the guy approached them, before he was beating his drum, the kids were already chanting? Because in the initial video, what it looks like is that this guy, Native American elder, goes up and he's beating his drum, and these kids are chanting and doing chants and mocking him and mocking his drumming. That's not what happened. The kids were chanting first, and why were they chanting first? Well, there's actually a couple of reasons. First of all, it turns out that these kids make this trip every year. Now, obviously not the same kids, but this high school makes this trip every single year, and they go to this place not to protest, but to wait for the bus. They had already gone to the March for Life, and they were doing some sightseeing. They give kids a chance to go out into D.C., 
and I guess take in some tourism stuff, maybe buy some souvenirs, that kind of thing. If you've been to the mall, you know that the mall is a pretty good meeting place for that. And they were getting ready to load up and head off to the bus and to head back home. And when this happened, when this guy came up and, and started drumming, they wait on the steps of the, uh, of the mall there that they are. This is where they meet every year. They've been doing this for a decade now. And they do some chants from their school, the same thing that you would do at a pep rally or at a basketball game or a football game. I mean, this is Alabama. We have all kinds of high school football. And so we know that this is not an uncommon thing for high school students to do. I mean, everybody knows them. And so to sort of give everybody an idea of where the group is, they've done this for 10 years now. They go up to the steps there on the mall and they start cheering and doing the school chant so everybody knows where they are. They've been doing this for a decade. So they started the chants first, and then the guy shows up and starts beating his drum in time with their chants. And here's the second part of this that you don't know about yet. The reason, part of the reason that they were doing these chants and doing them so loudly is because all day there have been conflicting protests going on. But by the Native American group that's there and by a group called the Black Hebrew Israelites. And the Black Hebrew Israelites, I mean, just absolutely reprehensible people. And I know because I've had personal dealings with them on a number of occasions. Their whole basis of their religion is based on racism. Everything about them is based on race. In fact, they say, they say that white people cannot go to heaven. Just by virtue of being white, you cannot go to heaven. I know I've been told that by them I don't know how many times. There used to be people that called into the radio program that claimed this same group. They're part of this group, and they say that black people are the real Jews. People that are Jews now are not actually Jews, and they're actually not going to be able to go to heaven, and neither are white people. I mean, just really reprehensible racist stuff. They believe that your salvation is based on the melanin in your skin. How ridiculous is that? But anyway... So that's the group that was there initially. And we actually have a lot of the footage coming directly from him, from them. You can hear them yelling in the background of that news clip that we just watched. And the thing about this is that group has been taunting the Native Americans the whole time and been shouting evil racist things to them, to the kids that were there, the Covington kids, and to other black people calling them the N-word. There's about two hours worth of video that you can look up on YouTube, and they just use racial slurs and, I mean, just reprehensible language to everybody. Uh, calling people MFers, calling, I mean, just dis disgusting stuff. I can't even play it on the air because there's so much swearing that it would just be video that's completely bleeped out without any sound, and so it wouldn't do any good. I tried to edit some of it last night. I literally couldn't because every other word was swearing and racial slurs, calling other black people the N-word, all kinds of stuff. So let's go ahead and look at another clip that kind of shows a little bit of that. Sorry, wrong one. You're not savages. You are not savages. You are the children of God, according to the Bible. You are the children of Israel. Before you started worshiping totem poles, you was worshiping the true living God. That's right. Before you became an idol worshiper, you was worshiping the true and living God. And this is the reason why this land was taken away from you. Because you worship everything except the most high. You worship every creation except the creator. That's right. And that's what we are here to tell you to do. We are here to tell you to wake up to the four corners of the earth. This is the truth of the Holy Bible. We don't have a microphone, brother. Okay, and this is the, this is the part of freedom of the speech and freedom of religion, and that's what we out here for. Okay, and uh, I hear you. I honor my God. We honor our God, brother, and that's what we are here to tell you what you have to do. You have to come away from the Lord. You have to come away from your religions, philosophies, and doctrines and start worshiping the true and living power, which, which his name is Yahweh. That's who's the, the most high God. That's right. The most high God, his name is Yahweh. 
You're not supposed to worship eagles, buffaloes, That's rams, right. Right. all types of animals. That's right. This is the reason why the Lord took away your land. You're not an Indian. Indian means savage. You know where that name came from? You know where that name came from? It came from the so-called white man. That's what happened. Okay? Who told us that? Look up the word Indian. Right. You'll find it out for yourself. Indian means savage. Come See how much they respect you, Israel? Look at all of them. All these Americans. Go ahead, what you say? That's right. Here come Gad. Here come Gad. Here come Gad. Look, look at our Make America Great Again hats. Look at the hats. Look at the hats. We ain't taking. Look, we not taking. Look at Gad. That's right, Gad. Look again. All right, so three clips there that are spliced together from the black Hebrew nationalist. And I did edit for time because, like I said, the, the whole video is like two hours long. So there's a couple things that you saw in there. First of all, at the beginning, the kids aren't there. It's just the black Hebrew national or the, the black Hebrew Israelites and the Native Americans. And the entire day, the black Hebrew Israelites have been attacking the Native Americans. And you'll even see after they're shouting and calling them idol worshipers and calling them savages and all these other disgusting terms, one of the Native American guys comes up and is like, guys, can you, can you please cut it out? He's very peaceful. He's very respectful. He's not trying to cause waves. And so he goes there and actually asks them, can you knock it off? And so the guy just rejects him and tells him to go on, so the guy walks away. And when that happens, you've also got... Uh, when that happens, you've also got this guy, who is, uh, uh, is the, the kind of the ringleader for the black Hebrew uh, Israelites, just shouting him down, yelling at him, telling him to go away. And then you also have him calling Indian savages and saying that they're idol worshippers, which, by the way, is not true. Most Native Americans that I've talked to, and I've talked to a few of them, I wouldn't say that I, you know, spend a lot of time with them, but most of the ones that I've talked to are actually Christians. Now, they hold to the traditions and, and the culture, just like we would study, for example, Greek mythology or something. To them, it's just history. Their religious beliefs actually are the scripture. They just happen to also know historically about some of their culture and where they came from. And so that's really where you're, you're going from them. And then you'll also see that when the, the guy starts walking up to them, when the Native American guy starts walking up to him banging the drum, you hear them yelling, here comes Gad, here comes Gad. If you know who Gad is, Gad is a pagan god of fortune that's mentioned in Isaiah 65. If you're looking at an older translation, for example, you're looking at uh, a King James Version. It's going to use the word Gad. A newer translation will say the word fortune because that's what the word Gad means. And so it's an old pagan god of fortune. And so even when the Native Americans are coming up there and start drumming, they're still jeering at them. They're still mocking the Native Americans. They're still referring to them as pagans. And so if there's a villain in all of this, it's the black Hebrew nationalist. And they're the ones that are causing all this trouble. And then the kids, they start getting excited because they've seen these two groups clashing with each other for a long time, ever since the kids have been there. And so they think the Native Americans are actually coming and banging the drum to help them drown out the evil racist chants of the black Hebrew Israelites. That's what they think is going on, and the reason that their chants and the drums match up is because they think the Native American guy is there to help them out. That's the reason that they were excited, that's the reason that they were smiling, that they're glad to see him. They weren't jeering at the guy, they thought he was there to help them drown out their chants. And what's really despicable is that after all this, after all this goes on, the Native American elder, Nathan Phillips, just goes to the media and just lies about them. Says all of these horrible things that we read in that article that you just saw. So he lied about being blocked. He lied about them being the aggressors. He lied about them yelling, build the wall, because there's about two hours of video, and at no point do any of these kids ever yell, build the wall. 
He lied about them saying build the wall. He lied about them using racial slurs. They never do, if you watch the whole video. And he called these kid predators and the black people were their prey. If you're watching the video, it looks like the opposite, actually. And he also said that uh, these, he also happens to be a left-wing activist with a long history of causing racial division, of, of causing this whole thing, because at Eastern Michigan, he actually had, a, there was a story where at Eastern Michigan, this particular guy already caused problems for kids there, and, and actually, even though there was no proof, there was no evidence, trying to drum up a racial controversy saying that kids at Eastern Michigan University were discriminating against him. And this guy's been a liberal activist for over 30 years. So this is a game that he is accustomed to playing. This is something that he, as a general rule, has quite a bit of experience in. And also, I want to play one other clip for you. This is when another one of the Native Americans confronts another kid in the crowd. So did you hear what he said to him? He's like, you're just white. You're a white man. Go back to Europe. This isn't your land. This is our land. If you ever want to do a Lippmann's test and figure out, okay, is something that he's saying racist, all you got to do is reverse it. All you got to do is say, okay, if I replace the race in this particular quote with another race, would it be something that would not be acceptable? If you had a white person saying to a black person, this is our land, go back to Africa. Don't you think that would be perceived as racist? Because I certainly do. And you know what? It would be. And so this guy, Native American, that's with this movement, saying, you're just a white man, you don't understand, go back to Europe, this isn't your land, this is our land, we've been here a million years. And the Catholic kid is saying, this is everybody's land. We all come from Africa. We all come from, you know, back when the continents were all one. We all come from back when the land was everybody's. And so he's actually giving a message of unity. He's actually saying we should all come together and we should think of this as everybody's land and we should all share. It's the Native American guy saying, get off our land, get out of our country. You're just white. You're just going to be white. You can't compete. So, so just shut up. And then the kid who was having the guy drum in his face he turns around and says, look, look, don't, don't engage. Don't argue with them. These kids were the peacekeepers. They were the ones trying to defuse the situation. The black Hebrew nationalists started the conflict, and the Native Americans jump in to try to rile the white kids up. And the way that this Native American elder, and by the way, even the Detroit Free Press confirmed or sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say confirmed, said in their article, we couldn't actually confirm whether or not this guy's a Vietnam vet or not, so he may even be lying about that. Which, by the way, is a federal crime. It's called the Stolen Valor Act. But anyway, if this is what is going on, and this Native American guy is, he's there to cause all these problems, and he says these just horrific things about these young individuals, which I would say behaved admirably, this guy is a bald-faced liar and a wicked, wicked man. That he would go after kids and target children for his own political gain. That he would go after them and just lie about them with impunity. America, we have to do something about this. 
because context matters and because the media completely destroyed the story and the only motive that I can see is that these kids happen to be white and happen to be wearing Make America Great Again hats. And because they saw, oh my gosh, these are a bunch of white kids, white privileged private school Christian kids in MAGA hats taunting this individual, this Native American guy, this person of color, oh my gosh, this is the greatest story ever. And they jumped on it and they grabbed onto that narrative and they still, many of them, are not letting go because they want the story to be true so badly, they will throw truth to the wind and just hang on to that narrative. Because in their mind, it confirms every evil, wicked thing that they believe about Donald Trump supporters. That's the reason that they jumped on this story, and that's the reason they're refusing to let go of it. They have allowed their own bias, their own hatred for Donald Trump to be portrayed and projected onto these kids and they are perfectly fine with their lives being ruined. They are perfectly fine with their parents receiving death threats. Didn't even consider the consequences because they wanted to tell this story so badly. And it's absolutely disgusting. The media should be ashamed of itself. And this guy, in particular, Nathan Phillips, he ought to be ashamed of himself too. And I hope, because this seems like a pretty clear-cut case, I hope that somebody sues him for slander. I hope that somebody brings a defamation case against him, and I hope they sue him for every penny he's got. All right, it looks like they, they need the studio for something, so I'm not going to be able to do a Daily Dose of Stupid or Chaplin's Report like I planned, but that's going to be our show for today. Thank you so much for being with us. Stay the course, friends.